Welcome everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Wilder Foundation. We're so pleased to have you all with us tonight. Um, thank you to everyone for being here to welcome Ambassador Ronald Newman to Minnesota. And we're really giving him a true Minnesota welcome with our changing weather. So we set that up just for you, Ambassador. So we're happy to be able to do that. Um, we're very excited for the fact that we have around 80 folks that have joined us uh, in the room and about 100 more people online with us tonight. So we have a great uh, turnout for what's in a very important program, and we're very pleased for that. Um, I should say you should have gotten a little um, ticket when you came in. So you know, if, if you leave, you, you have to be here for the drawing. So make sure you stay all the way through. But we have a wonderful drawing tonight for uh, uh, some, to be able to attend our Culture Through Cuisine event that's coming up as well. So my name is Phil Hansen. For those that don't know me, I'm the president of Global Minnesota. If you're not familiar with Global Minnesota, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan, membership-based organization really dedicated to promoting and advancing international understanding and engagement. Uh, it's a wonderful organization. We offer a wide variety of programming. Um, the programming tonight kind of falls into the category of our world affairs programming that we offer on a regular basis to the community. We also have children's programming in the K through 12 category, a range of different classes and programs we provide to kids in the school that's internationally focused plus university level programming for our international students. We also offer international business roundtable programming, sustainability roundtables, and networking events for our business community here. And people know us very much for the fact that we offer international professional exchanges for visiting delegations from all over the world. I'm giving them an introduction to our skilled professionals, our great companies, our great organizations, and really what Minnesota is all about. So we're excited to be a part of all of that. A lot of amazing things have been going on in Global Minnesota. Um, last week, we hosted Ambassador Kathleen Doherty, the former U.S. Ambassador to Cyprus, for a terrific program on the challenges, issues, and opportunities in Cyprus. We also hosted a, 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 a professional group of science and technology experts from the Middle East who had a chance to meet with Medtronic, the University of Minnesota Agriculture School, among many other locations as well. And we even helped to co-host last week a uh, showing of the documentary Finding Her Beat about a group of women that kind of broke the barrier in taiko drumming. And we had a chance to show and be a part of that program as well. And telling you all that to give you just a sense of the wide range of programming that we offer through Global Minnesota. So a couple of things to tease you here coming up for the organization on November 6th. We're actually having for the first time in some time a get to know Global Minnesota event. So if you know someone you think would benefit from this organization or learning more about it, it's a chance to just get to know us a little bit. And I'll be hosting a program right at our office um, over on the University of Minnesota campus if you'd like to join us for that. As I mentioned on November 28th, we have our Culture Through Cuisine. For those that don't know this, we actually roughly every month or so take over an international restaurant. We don't take it over. We, we, we're largely the population of people that are there that night. And uh, the, the owner and the cook do a, a, great, a great meal for us. This, in this case, it's an Ecuadorian restaurant that we're going to be partaking in called La Mesa. And you get a chance to hear from the owner, from the chef, learn about the food, learn about the country. And it's a really great, great experience. A huge event for us coming up, and we hope many of you will join us is for our Global Business Outlook event. We'll be taking a look at megatrends going forward into the year for international business, and that's going to be taking place out at the 3M Innovation Center coming up on the 29th, as I mentioned. We we'll kind of round out our year with our huge annual WorldQuest um, trivia competition. It's going to be this year at the Science Museum on December 7th. This group in here, you guys could form teams. You'd be great teams for our international trivia. It's a lot of fun. We have great food, great opportunities, a lot of camaraderie. And Tom Cran from Minnesota Public Radio is our, our host question asker. So I hope you can join us for that. I want to thank you, uh, all of our members in the, in the room tonight. Would you raise your hand if you're a member of Global Minnesota? Yeah, we have a pretty good showing for members. Look around. If, they, if you saw somebody with not their hand up, can you find those people at the break and encourage them to become Global Minnesota members with us? Um, but if you're interested, we actually are offering uh, for people that aren't members right now a promotion. If you become a new member, you get a free ticket to the Global Business Outlook, but you got to do it before the end of October coming up here. I want to thank our partners for tonight's event, the American Academy of Diplomacy, the Una Chapman Cox Foundation, the ASU Leadership Diplomacy and National Security Lab, as well as our promotional sponsors, the Committee on Foreign Relations Minnesota, the Minnesota International NGO Network, and the United Nations Association of Minnesota. Lots of great partners help us to deliver all this wonderful programming. Tonight, we are going to be taking questions from the audience using roving microphones. If you have a question during the Q&A, simply raise your hand and a member of our team will head over with the microphone for you. 
And now for the evening, I'd like to start out by doing a couple of introductions. I'm gonna introduce our moderator because he will just come up once uh, the ambassador has completed his remarks and then we'll have a conversation between the two of them. So let me introduce our moderator for this evening. Our moderator is gonna be Dr. Jacob Gale. Uh, Dr. Gale is a, an esteemed professional in the realm of global health and philanthropy. And Dr. Gale has a distinguished career in international public health and diplomacy for over 30 years in several of the world's leading uh, development and philanthropic institutions, including being the deputy vice president for the Ford Foundation, senior public health officer for the CDC, and other health and social development roles into the USAID, the UN, the World Bank, and the Carter Center. Dr. Gale has led, led the Medtronic Foundation for 12 years. Uh, Jacob has served on six continents and completed long-term residential assignments across Sub-Saharan Africa, the Caribbean, North America, and Europe. He currently serves on several boards, including the Oberlin College, HCMC, and the board now, thankfully, of Global Minnesota. So we're great to have, it's great to have uh, Jacob with us tonight and give him a round of applause for joining us. We'll look forward to some conversation with Jacob in just a few minutes, but now I'd like to welcome our esteemed guest and visiting speaker, Ambassador Ronald Newman. Ambassador Newman currently serves as the president of the American Academy of Diplomacy, whose goal is to support and strengthen U.S. diplomacy and enhance public appreciation for its critical role in advancing the national interest. He previously served three times as a U.S. ambassador to Algeria, Bahrain, and Afghanistan. Before Afghanistan, Mr. Newman, a career member of the Senior Foreign Service, served in Baghdad from February 2004 with the Coalition Provisional Authority and then as, as uh, Embassy Baghdad's liaison with the Multinational Command, where he, where he has, was deeply involved in coordinating the political part of military actions. Prior to working in Iraq, he served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Near East Affairs with responsibility for North Africa and the Arabian Peninsula and director uh, of the Office uh, of the Northern uh, Gulf Affairs. Earlier in his career, he was Deputy Chief of Mission in Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates, and Sana'a in Yemen, Principal Officer in Tabriz, Iran, and the Economic Commercial Officer in Dakar, Senegal. His previous Washington assignments included service at, at the, uh, as Jordan Desk Officer, Staff Assistant in the Middle East Bureau, and Political Officer in the Office of the Southern uh, European Affairs. He's the author of two books, a memoir and a book on his time in Afghanistan. At the Academy, he's focused particularly on efforts to maintain adequate state and USAID budgets and staffing and upgrade professional formation to enable these institutions to carry out their responsibilities. So we're very grateful to have the ambassador with us here in Minnesota. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome up to the podium here, um, Ambassador Ronald Newman. Thank you very much. It's a real, by the way, can everybody hear me? This, I, think I'm, I think I'm working through two mics. Now, are you getting an echo if I'm over here? Okay. Um, so I'm told that I better have this one of the people online. We'll all go to sleep. Um, so I, I'm really happy to be with you and I'm really happy to see so many people here. You know, when you come to give a talk on bureaucratic reorganization, well, Exactly. That. You, know, you, you wonder how many people are going to think, well, that's just slightly better than a talk on the budget, uh, <laughs> which has never been a subject that attracts many people. The, the outcome may be critical, but the subject does not interest people. So let me just see if I've got this clicker working correctly here. We seem to be going in the right direction. That's a good start. So let me explain, first of all, a little bit how this project came about a little bit more about what I am. Uh, the American Academy of Diplomacy, first of all, I should tell you that even though it's called the Academy, it's because members elect other members, like the Academy of Science or something, it actually has nothing to do with teaching. It teaches absolutely nothing. Um, but it's what it does do. Wait a minute, if I move around, am I confusing people online? Uh, I'm okay. Okay. So, the Academy was formed 40 years ago this year. It was formed by people like Henry Kissinger and Ellsworth Bunker, uh, John J. McCoy, who most of you won't know now, but who was a great name at the time, uh, Elliot Richardson, and uh, George Kennan, who's a great name in uh, American foreign policy history, was one of the founding members. It has always been a small organization of senior practitioners. 
I like to say that it tries to, it wants to be elite, but it does not want to be elitist, which is an attitude that I would hope we don't display, although I can't be sure. Um, it has two purposes now. One is talking to Americans about why is diplomacy important and why should you support it? Why should you encourage your Congress to fund it properly? Um, something which is often not quite understood. And the other purpose is telling the State Department and the Congress where we think they can do things better. And, you know, that'll probably is a lifetime of employment. Um, but particularly now, because as America goes into the 21st century, we're now, we're now well into it, um, there are a whole range of new, pro comparatively new problems that we have to deal with. Transnational problems, crime, climate, pandemics, drugs, none of those things can be solved on just a state-to-state -state basis. And yet states are still the major players. There are no international organizations that can command solutions. That makes diplomacy pretty important. It also means diplomats have to have new skills, refresher skills. But one of the things to remember is we don't get to get rid of much of anything. I mean, we've traded in our quill pens for electronic communication. But when you ask, you know, what, did a, what was a 19th century diplomat responsible for? And you say, okay, of those skill responsibilities, which ones do we no longer have? You can't find any. You know, everything new is added on top of the old responsibilities, with perhaps the fact that you know you get more orders faster with the electronic means. So years ago, I was in Algeria. My first uh, distant predecessor, the first consul in Algeria, he was sent out to acquire in Europe the gold to pay a ransom to the day of our jail, Algiers, for, to pay off the treaty we had signed to free American seamen. We were you know, that was our first effort in paying for hostages. Um, and he went 13 months with no instructions. Uh, you know, it, at one point he gave, he promised to give the day a frigate if he would extend the treaty. Now, if I promised somebody to give them a frigate without Washington's authorization, my career would have been very short. Uh, so some things do change, but not the major responsibility. So that's what the Academy is all about. And sorry for the commercial interruption, but on to this study. So we need, there's a lot of new skills. There are a lot of things we need to do. We need to fit diplomacy for the 20th century, 21st century. Um, and we often have the problem that we're kind of episodic. We get, you know, sometimes our diplomacy, is a, our foreign policy gets a little like little kids playing soccer. Everybody runs for the ball. So we had the, um, yeah. at the end of the Cold War, there was this feeling, oh, Cold War is over, peace dividend. Uh, and we built 20 new embassies in the former Soviet Union without increasing staff. And we also began to take our eyes off certain balls. You know, so the Pacific was no longer very, Pacific Islands, those are not, you know, who cares? That's not important, the Cold War is over. Well, you know, few years ago, we started to look around and see, oh, that's interesting. The Chinese are, you know, getting ports and they're building access to places like Fiji and the Solomon Islands. So all of a sudden, we're now reopening embassies we closed in Pacific, but Pacific Islands. But it takes a while to get, an, you know, get money to authorize it to build the embassy. So playing catch up is not a very good way of dealing with what you don't pay attention to in the first place. And so this study comes out of a certain history. There was a study at Harvard done now almost three years ago, uh, had a lot of recommendations. Then this couple of years ago, now a year and a half ago, they took the four, what they thought were the most important recommendations uh, and built those out in great detail, even writing legislative language so that if you could get Congress interested, you could say, here, put this in. It looks just like this. Um, it doesn't necessarily work that way, but you know, that was the effort. And so this effort to enhance the professional capacity of the US Foreign Service and of US diplomacy overall had four main elements. 
that we talked about in this study. One was uh, an enhanced mandate for the people who operate overseas, clarifying all sorts of rules and responsibilities. Um, increasing the ability to uh, hire, retain highest quality individuals, providing the necessary education and training. I cannot tell you the number of studies that I have seen from right to left, from the Heritage Foundation to the most liberal think tanks over at least 20 years that focus on the Foreign Service, the American diplomats do not do adequate professional training. You can't be a doctor and keep your license without having continuing training. You can't be a lawyer without having continuing refresher training. You probably can't raise your, high, your paycheck as a high school teacher without occasional professional training. We don't do it. We have none. Um, we're very, we have language training. We're very, very good at language training, we train 60 odd languages. Um, but we don't train diplomats. We get tremendously qualified people, but we do nothing for them in professional education once they're in or next to nothing. And this has been observed over and over and over again. So that's an area we focused on. And the last area that I'm gonna talk about is the idea of creating a foreign service reserve. Now, this first, and I, I tell you, there's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of details in this kind of report. I promise you, I'm not going to bog you down in all of that because even if you were interested, you couldn't possibly retain it. But one of the areas we're talking about is ambassadorial authority. Uh, and it, I think it's important to remind people, and some of you already know this, that embassies are platforms. They're platforms for the entire US government. There are something like 20 or 26 cabinet departments and agencies which are represented overseas. The Foreign Service, the, the technical diplomats are often the landlord and the concierge for everybody else. One of the big issues ambassadors have to do is try to keep all these people going in the same direction because every one of them, although they're technically under the ambassador's authority, is getting emails and telephone calls and messages from their home agency saying, do this, do that, do something else. Ambassador's got to control. He, he has a big stick he can use because ultimately he or she can throw them out of country. But, you know, you don't always want to do that. So you got to find ways to control people. So we, one of the things we're talking about here is focusing on clarifying that authority. Um, a broader vision. What does this mean? I'll give you one example. Since, particularly since Benghazi and the killing of people there, we've had a tightening of security regulations driven by political fear in Washington. It affects both Democrats and Republicans. Um, it's it's nonpartisan, multi-party cowardice afraid of the political, for good reason, afraid of the political fallout if there's an incident. But the result has been to bottle up people too much so that people talk to government officials. They don't talk enough. And you know, this is mostly a problem of being in countries with risk, with war. It's not a problem if you're serving in Luxembourg. Um, mostly, I think. Uh, but People need to talk to the opposition. They need to talk to women leaders. They need to talk to students. They need to talk to all kinds of people. And you have to get out of the embassy because those people aren't all going to come to see you, particularly given that our security procedures for getting into embassies are often kind of insulting. Um, and one of the problems historically has been, along with Washington pressures, but something called the Accountability Review Board Act that became seen as a how do you, who's going to be found responsible when something happens? Who, who can we blame? So one of the projects the Academy took on a couple of years ago was trying to change that law, which we actually did. We got it rewritten. But I mention this because it's illustrative of the larger cultural change that needs to be undertaken in order to be effective overseas. And we were still, out, by the way, um, chasing after the department to take the additional measures needed to fully implement that. There are two really big ideas in this 
lengthy report. And by the way, the report is a great doorstop because it's really <laughs> thick. <laughs> so I'm giving you the summary version. You can feel good. Um, now, I told you that for years and years, we've had this problem of we don't do enough professional education. So in one sense, coming back and saying, hey, you need to do this. This is not new. But there are a couple of things that are new about it. One is for many years and in many studies, people have said, look, the military does this. How does the military do it? They have about a 15% or training floats, actually training transition hospitalization. And that gives them enough people beyond what you need to fill all the ranks of units so that you can send people off you know, like David Petraeus went off and got a PhD. You can send people to staff in college, staff schools. You can send them to higher level training. We don't do that. We have a few of those. And so for years, people have used the military example, and they've said, well, the military does 15%. That's what you need. And then you say to the Congress, we need 15%. And they said, what are you smoking? You know, we're not going to pay for that. So one of the things we did is drill down and say, what do we really need? What do we really talking about. And we said, we actually, when we looked at it, we don't need 15%. We need about 8% of which we got about four. So even what we really need is actually much smaller than what people have said, but weren't funding. And then the second thing we said is if you're going to have more people, if you're going to do this, you can't always give people positions for training and then suck them up for the crisis. And that's what we've done repeatedly. Colin Powell, when he was Secretary of State, went to the Congress and argued, I got to have more positions, I got to have training. And he got about an extra thousand bodies. And they all disappeared into Iraq and Afghanistan. And the I mean, not the people, they came back, but the positions never came back. And we're short now. We've got, I say we as though I was still the guy, sorry, it's professional debility. Um, but we, we, the State Department, is short of people all over the world. They have gaps all over Africa, particularly. Uh, they have too many positions filled by officers that are too junior for the job because they don't have enough. And so there's this hunger and you give people for training and then, oh, but I need them over here. So one of the things we're proposing, and that is a new idea, is legislative language that would fence off training positions so that you can't move them without a special waiver from the Secretary of State. You know, it doesn't mean you couldn't ever move them, but it's damn hard. And it needs to be hard. Otherwise, there's no point in funding the additional people. I mean, there may be all kinds of points in having additional people, but not for training if you're going to suck them off for other things. This is a big lift to get Congress to do this. Uh, there is a lot of stuff in the report about an effective, uh, making the workforce more effective. Some of it's noted up here. Um, I won't go through all these things. The point is you need the right kind of workforce. They need to be effective. You need to re recruit people who can do your job. You need to get a proper balance between career and non-career appointees. You know, we have historically about 30% of our ambassadors are not career diplomats. Some of them are brilliant. Some of them are there because they made large political contributions, and although it's contrary to law to make that the basis on which you appoint them. In fact, it happens by both parties. And most of them are serious players, and some of them are a walking disaster. Um, not very many. You know, you can exaggerate. Some have been great. I mean, after all, our first non-career diplomat was Benjamin Franklin. He was pretty good. Uh, you know, so it, it's not like every non-career can't do the job. And it's not, frankly, like every career officer is brilliant, but there's too high a percentage. And, and it's, this is not a partisan issue because you find this in every administration. So you had some pretty terrible examples in the Trump administration. You had a guy at one post in Iceland who was afraid to go out without a security detail. <laughs> Everybody else is biking to work. Um, but in the Obama administration, you had an inspector's report of one embassy that said the ambassador has so destroyed morale that people, this was in Luxembourg, are curtailing their assignments to go to Afghanistan and Iraq. Now, you know, 
The atmosphere in your embassy has got to be pretty poor when you want to get on a plane to get out of Luxembourg and go to a war in Afghanistan. Um, but that was a political appointee uh, of the Obama administration. Uh, one that Obama nominated was going to Norway, turned out not to know whether they had a president or a prime minister, was pilloried by Senator Kane, um, pulled the nomination, didn't go. He's now been renominated and confirmed for Greece. Um, all I want to say, we've had some brilliant non-career. And we've had many who, if not brilliant, were certainly serious, took their job seriously, learned their job, and did it well. But we have too many of the other kind. Uh, and so you know, part of this, we're not going to, frankly, I doubt we're going to fix it. Because whenever you go to Congress and want to talk about that stuff, you find that uh, you know, if the party's out of office now, they're going to want to do it when they get their turn. So they're not really interested in fixing it. But there's a lot of things underneath that you can do with personnel that you need to do. And we do a lot of that. The biggest idea and the fourth one that I want to talk to is this idea of a diplomatic reserve corps. The State Department has repeatedly been asked to surge people to take care of crises and problems. The earliest account I found of this is 1848, when the Army asked State, can you send us a few people to help with the administration of Mexico when, during the war? And State failed. Um, we, have not, we have never been able to do this adequately. And the reason is simple. It's nothing to do with willingness. It's that State is a fully deployed organization. There's no units that are in training that can be sent. So when you have a crisis, you strip people out of jobs and send them, and then you leave the jobs vacant or somebody else is double tasked, and it doesn't work very well. When we did a study of this back in 2008, the State Department was 10%, had 10% vacancies all over the world because of the people we'd sent off to Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, when there's a crisis, we don't have anybody, you, you can pull people. Uh, we had the civilian surge in Afghanistan at one point. Um, very much criticized by our military colleagues. I remember I was making one of my periodic return trips to Afghanistan. And I remember one of the division commanders saying to me, I feel the civilian surge lapping at my ankles. Um, and he was not very impressed with the quality. And the, now the quality wasn't so bad. He was not impressed with the, the numbers. So the idea of a reserve corps has kind of come around periodically. I think first thing to remember when you look at this idea is what you need for crises is not always wars. There are other crises. You have evacuations for pandemics. You need people to deal with that. That doesn't mean you need a whole bunch of senior diplomats. It means you need people who know how to charter airplanes. You need to know pe people who need to know how to evacuate people on the ground and handle American citizens. You need other skills. Uh, so the idea of this is a very methodical stage program. It takes a year, they call it the zero year, to figure out what do you need at what levels of skill. The idea is people sign up for it, very much like the military reserve. They sign up for a three-year, uh, our notion, they sign up for a three-year renewable term during which they have regular summer training for a couple of weeks. They have periodic monthly training. So because you want people with skills and the laws change and the procedures change. So you want to be able to update the skills, not just have a bunch of old guys and gals whose skills have atrophied. Uh, so you have periodic training and you have a legal requirement to go. So there are a lot of ideas about, you know, how we can use retired people, but all of those are based on, you know, well, could you help out with Libya next month. This is, here's your tickets, you're leaving Wednesday. You know, it's a very different concept. Um, the whole thing staged over five years, bringing in 250 people a year to get to about a thousand people at the end of the force would cost, by the end of the fifth year, you'd be spending about 45, uh, 45 billion a year, 45 million a year. That is, half the cost of one F-35 fighter. But of course, we don't do budgets that way. We do budgets of 
There's 700 billion over there. This is the State Department budget. We're gonna put it under a microscope and figure out why it's too much and how we can cut it. Um, but it, in comparative terms, it is, it is not a huge sum. There are, as I said, there are other things that you would use a reserve corps for. Have any of you tried to get a passport lately? It's about a six month delay right now to get a passport. Now there's a reason for that because they totally stopped work during COVID because they couldn't work in closed space. And now they're trying to hire more people, but you have to have a security background check to issue passports because at the end of the day, you don't want to be giving passports to terrorists. But security checks these days are not fast. If you had a reserve cord, you could be using them to plug the gap. We have huge waiting lines for visas overseas. Well, now mostly that's a problem for the foreigners. That's too bad you can't get your visa. But if you're a rich Indian businessman who wants to come to the US with your family for a month and spend all kinds of money, um, and you're told, you know, well, we've got an appointment for you. It's in seven and a half months. Actually, that's faster than most of them. Um, maybe they're going to Australia. Maybe they're not coming here to spend their money. Uh, and if you're a businessman who's got business here, you can get a visa, but you jump through all kinds of hoops to do it. A reserve corps would plug those holes. You can put those people out to fix, the, to hold that until you finish your hiring and getting people and taking care of the roads. So what I'm trying to say is simply that there are a lot of different problems you can have that don't need a thousand people deployed like a military unit to deal with the war but which would allow us to have a strong, flexible response capability to deal with foreign crises. And it wasn't so long ago that you may remember we were evacuating thousands of people overseas at the beginning of COVID. It was a huge job. People don't recognize how much went into that. You know, there was one country where they, in order to prevent the spread of COVID in the country, the government closed everything down and you weren't allowed to drive on road, except we had American citizens scattered around the country and they had to be able to get to the capital, to get to the airport, to get out. In that case, it was a very creative team. I think it was the ambassador. They, they wrote a letter on letterhead stationery, you know, that says this person has authority to travel. They had no authority from the government. They just made it up, um, <laughs> but it worked. They got people through the checkpoints. Uh, so, you know, you, you are gonna, deal with those kinds of crises where you got to have creativity and you got to have people out to do it. So that's the idea behind the Reserve Corps. Now, I have to say this is heavy sledding. We're working this with the Congress. There, right now, this is, a, this is a next year kind of proposition because last year, the State Department was authorized or required by Congress to do a study of what they think of a Reserve Corps idea. They're working on that now. I have a feeling it's going to be much more modest than we want because they're terribly afraid that Congress will tell them to do it and won't give them any money. This is called an uh, unfunded mandate and the State Department lives in fear of unfunded mandates, um, which is not totally unreasonable. Uh, but anyway, this will come more clearly into focus. The education and training part, we almost got it into a bill that's pending um, then at the last minute it didn't. We we're hoping we may get it in. Um, I don't know how much about legislation you know or how much you want to know. Um, you know, there's a famous saying of German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck that the two things you never want to let people see being made are policy and sausage because each is disgusting. Uh, and, um, so this process is pretty disgusting, but you know, last year they managed to pass a State Department author authorizing bill. They passed it by putting the entire legislation into the National Defense Authorization Act. So that the, the whole law for the State Department authorization for last year begins on page, I'm not kidding you, 3,500 of the NDAA, <laughs> which encompasses all sorts of other stuff as well. So they're trying to do that this year. We're trying to get something on at least the principle of the long-term training and the and get the language on fencing it off. I don't know if we'll make it. If we don't make it, well, we come back and try it again next year. Uh, the, the getting things done legislatively 
is not fast, and especially not in this. This climate is particularly bad. The Senate marked up a draft for uh, State Department authorization. The House has decided it can't even mark up an authorization because the splits on the committee are too difficult. But there is a negotiation between the staffs, between the Senate version of the bill and the version that does not exist except in the minds of some people in the House, but nevertheless, they're negotiating a compromise. So we'll, that's a little glimpse of Washington for you. You're better off here. Um, but yeah, so that's, the, that's why we might not succeed, but it's why we think it's really important to keep telling people in Congress why this is all important. And that's what we're doing. This is the basics of what the idea is and I thank you for being courteous and listening to me. And I'm happy to take questions. I guess we're going to do that in the discussion. So I don't know how to. I don't know how to turn this off. So I don't know what, I don't know what happens after that. And I think, you, Katie, you want to move some chairs up? Is that the? Yeah. You have to see. OK. Well, Put it where I'd be happy to move it, but you have to tell me where you want it. And can we turn this off now? Yes. Thanks for inviding me to join well, your Dr. Dr. Gale. And and it's a pleasure, pleasure to carry on this conversation further and welcome everyone to this dialogue. We're looking forward to receiving um, questions both from this audience here as well as our audience that's online. Um, while, while we're waiting, I wanted to ask you a question about um, the average day in the U.S. Embassy. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> That's kind of like asking a fireman about his average day. You know, you put your hat and boots by the pole and wait for the bell to ring. Uh, so an awful lot of that, of your day is driven by what's going on. Uh, you know, I mean, more that's obvious, but... You know, it can be all kinds of things. You walk in in the morning and find out what's in the press, and you know that that's going to preoccupy you for the day. Um, oh, I remember on my first tour, I went home when I was consular officer in Senegal, uh, the only consular officer. I went home at noon for lunch and told my wife, it's just quiet as a tomb in there. There's nothing happening. I'll be home early. Mm -hmm. Got back to the office, put my key in the door. A fella came rushing up to me and said, I just brought a drilling rig in. You have to go and sign off the crew and sign on another crew. And this is, by the way, 19th century legislation that is on the books, but irrelevant. You know, so go look at the rank, go look at the manual, grab every kind of paper and file and off to a ship to sign off a crew. Never done that before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's just all kinds, it can be a crisis in the government. You know, if you were, in Afghanistan at a certain period, you woke up one morning to find there was a news article that somebody burned a Koran and all of a sudden you had demonstrations. Mm -hmm. You weren't planning for that. So an enormous amount of your job is reactive. And a big challenge is how do you keep certain priorities assigned and keep your eye on them even as you are constantly dealing with whatever the challenge of the morning is? Because you don't get to say, oh, well, you know, I had other priorities in mind this morning at breakfast and I can't really deal with your crisis. Um, yeah, that's not going to work. So. Uh, well, question has been asked as to who the ambassador represents. Is the ambassador representing the people of the United States? Does the ambassador represent the administration um, of the current administration of the United States. And is there a difference? There is a very clear answer and a clear difference. Sometimes it gets full of foggy. The ambassador is the personal representative of the president. This is goes back to sovereigns sending their representative to deal with other sovereigns. And in fact, it's one reason that before you send an ambassador, you have to ask the receiving country if they will accept that ambassador. You don't just get to send somebody if they won't accept them. Um, now, in modern diplomacy, we are also representing a lot of ideas and ideals of America and Americans about 
diploma of democracy and human rights and other things. And we are talking obviously to the host country population as well as to the leaders. Now, you can have tension there. And you can have a tension between how much do you aggravate a foreign leader in order to talk to his people about your values, which is on one hand, that's okay, you know, we think they're wrong. They don't mind, we don't mind them knowing. But how much do you undercut your own effectiveness if they won't listen to you on important issues because you have yeah, aggravated them? There's no, there's no one size fits all. Uh, so you're gonna, you know, that's gonna have to be uh, sort of felt. You'll feel your way through that on any given occasion. It, it also goes back to the fact that foreign policy does not, you do not get to have one priority. And a lot of times you'll have a crisis, whatever's going on, people say, well, you have to get your priorities straight. Well, you know, within reason that's true, but the fact is we have priorities of national interest, of national security, of human rights, and sometimes they're pulling against each other. And your job is to manage the tension. You don't get to say, this one is always the top. I, Sometimes, pardon me if I go on, sometimes they use, Egypt's an interesting case. So we have a huge interest in maintaining the Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. It's kept us out of war for almost, kept a major war, we had lots of little wars, but it's kept a major Arab-Israeli war away for 50 years. We have a big interest in human rights and they're not very good in Egypt. Mm -hmm. We have a big economic interest in the Suez Canal. Uh, in keeping that open. Did any of you happen to notice what happened when you had one week that the canal was closed because a ship ran aground and you had major disruption all over the entire world? Mm -hmm. Well, does that mean you can say human rights are never going to be as important as economic ones? So they'll always, no. But does it mean you could just write off the economic and say, well, that's always less important than beating them up? You can't. You're going to have to try to manage all three interests all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, speaking speaking of that, and and really having to respond to the challenge in country of the day, let's look at it on the other side. Here in the United States, the country that the ambassador is representing around the world, it seems like we're becoming more and more of a polarized um, society ourselves, a polarized culture. How does the events? How do the events of today in the United States impact? the representation that the ambassador has to do around the world? Well, they can certainly make it more difficult. Uh, now, this is not a wholly new problem. You know, when we went through the big civil rights years in the 60s and you had demonstrations and you had the, you know, the bridge in Alabama and people beaten up and you had campuses with police and, you know, that was also a problem where people were saying, how can you talk about human rights when you have this bifurcation in your own country? Was how, you know, you've had a hundred years and you still haven't got equality with your African-American population. And you know, that was true. And all you can do is say, yeah, but one of the things that we're very proud of is we have the ability in our country to correct ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, that we're still having to make that case. It's a little rougher because the polarization is here now. We haven't gotten through it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we'll get through it. I mean, if the polarization really destroys the country, you won't have to worry about it in our foreign policy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah. short of that, you know, what can I say? It is a rough patch. Mm -hmm. We have gone through rough patches before. Uh, you know, certainly the worst was the Civil War. But, you know, if you look at pictures, news clips of 1968, when you had National Guard killing students on campus at Kent mm -hmm. State, or you look at clips of Chicago, where you had fistfights in the Democratic Convention, and then you had police beating other people with clubs in the streets of Chicago and sticking them in police vans, mm -hmm. um, that was pretty bad, too. Right. Um, so it doesn't prove you will survive. Mm -hmm. It just tells you that, yes, we have been through rough times before and we've made it, so maybe we'll make it. But there is a big problem with people listening to each other. Uh, and you know, there's, a big, there's a big difference between dogma and ideology. And 
ideology is an intellectual construct and you can argue about it and you can sharpen an ideological dispute with the argument. Mm -hmm. Dogma is faith. Mm -hmm. And if you have faith, whether it's religious faith or political faith, and somebody challenges it, well, that's not a, some subject you can talk about. Right. You know, that's just faith. Um, and it has to be defended. And that doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. And that keeps you split. But there's, you know, you see an awful lot in communities where people still work together to solve all kinds of problems that suggest that if you might stop shouting, maybe you could work it. Well, we're going to find out if the House of Representatives can stop shouting and work right shortly. Uh, so keep your fingers crossed and see bells fast. You know, this is, we are not out of the woods, but yeah, it makes it a more, it makes it harder. And I think if you're a diplomat and you're having to deal with this, the most important thing you can do is be honest about it mm -hmm. and not try to, you know, oh, well, it doesn't, yeah, it does matter. We know it matters, but at least we have a system that will allow people again to go back to the polls. And, you know, we'll all argue about it. We'll all shout for another year and a half. Sorry about that. Uh, but at the end of that, we will get another verdict. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the strengths. That is the fundamental strength of democracy is its ability to correct itself, mm -hmm. to allow the people to correct itself, themselves. Mm -hmm. Cross your fingers. In, indeed, indeed. You know, my, my worry is that we are losing the uh, understanding of what diplomacy means if we can't apply it at home, how do we apply diplomacy elsewhere? I hope I'm wrong, um, yeah. but but let's let's assume let's and, and I love the description of the ways in which we can try to renew, reinvigorate, um, a change our diplomacy worldwide. So you have the role then, um, Mr. Ambassador, to write the help wanted mm -hmm. ad for tomorrow's diplomat what would that help wanted ad ask for and who would we hope would be applying for that job well the second is easy we want a broad cross section of people that look like america we want everybody represented while holding them to the highest standards of merit uh, and competitive excellence to come in and the foreign service exam you know foreign service takes people by exam and the pass rate is slightly harder than getting into harvard mm -hmm. without any extra bonus for uh, <laughs> you know alumni <laughs> faculty um, <laughs> but then we have to train them as well so we want people that are creative we want ideally we want people who will learn how to dispute that's a, no big organization to my knowledge has ever built a culture that does not tend to court conformity. Mm -hmm. Some individuals do, organizations don't. So that's a constant struggle uh, to get people who will dissent mm -hmm. respectfully. But you had that even in Afghanistan, as you saw. Uh, so in short, we want the very best America has from every ethnicity and gender. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the way, you know, speaking about being diplomatic, it wasn't exactly your question, but I'd want to. That's okay. That's okay. You know, a lot of people think being diplomatic means avoiding a point. Mm -hmm. They'll say, "Well, I'm not going to be very diplomatic. That means I'm going to really dodge the question. I'm going to speak frankly." This is not being diplomatic. You know, my definition, or my favorite definition of being diplomatic is the ability to tell someone to go to hell in such a way that they look forward to the trip. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's not about not delivering the message. Mm -hmm. It's about how you deliver. Now, what is the business of diplomacy? A lot of people think it's go out and make nice with foreigners. No, mm -hmm. that's not what we're about. Our job is to go out and get foreigners to do what we want mm -hmm. and want and do it in a way that we and they like enough that we have a relationship where we can go back for the next issue. So part of being diplomatic is learning to listen, right? Because if you, you don't have to be sympathetic. You don't have to like a person. You don't have to like their views, but you have to be empathetic. You have to understand what their views are 
and why they feel them and how much of what they're telling you is hot air and how much is really deeply felt. Because only when you know that can you define where you might make deals, where you might have compromise. You can't do that if you're just busy hollering at people. Right. Uh, so being diplomatic is not about just pussyfooting around and being nice. Mm -hmm. It's about how you get messages across. A, a wise Egyptian ambassador once said to me, he said, you know, if you start off by saying, I think you're wrong, I'm going into defensive crouch and I'm ready to argue with you. <laughs> if you start off by saying, well, I understand what you're saying to me, but I have a little different view. I'm starting with my open mind to listen to how that might be different. The result is not, I mean, you're not going to say something necessarily different thereafter, but it's how you, just that little bit of how you start can make a difference. True. Very good point. Very good point. Now, one of the things that this audience has as a handicap is the fact that the two of us have both been in diplomatic positions as well as academic. You and I could talk all night long together, yeah. just the two of us. <laughs> Oh, and yeah. probably end up giving this group an exam to take. But I want to make sure that the audience not. knows that we're open to your questions, um, both here in this room as well as those who are online. So I want to encourage you to, to ask your questions. In the meantime, I've got a lot of questions for him as well. But I think, do we have? OK, all right. No, I won't pick them. You pick them. <laughs> you said that you would like to recruit people who look like all Americans. Uh, for the diplomatic corps. However, there are countries that will that are frowned upon people who look like some Americans. And I wonder if you could talk about some of the special challenges that women diplomats face, um, as there are some countries mm -hmm. in this world who may not accept a, a, a female diplomat or somebody in authority who's a female, but also for people who are gay. You know, if they're in the diplomatic corps, can they be sent to any country? What, what issues does this bring up? It definitely brings up issues. Now, uh, uh, Margo might be the one who should be responding to this as a woman in the Foreign Service, but let me say, the, the women's part has a longer, eva longer development. We've gotten much more recently into the issues of uh, gay, lesbian, other things. Uh, for a long time, you had a prejudice against sending women to certain countries. There was an ability, you know, you can, oh, you can't send a woman to the Arab countries, no. Well, that's nonsense. And I can tell you that I've known a number of women who are first-class Arabists, their Arabic's better than mine, um, who have done very well with very macho people. Partly is because if you go out as an American diplomat, you represent the country. You're much, you're, you may have trouble with a gate guard who doesn't think you should come in, but you're not going to have trouble seeing the minister if he wants to see the American ambassador or, you know, if they want a visa and you're the American consul because they can like it or not get the visa. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that has... I don't know that there's any country to which we wouldn't send a woman now or, or that we'd even think about that very much. There is still a problem with not having enough women in the senior ranks, although that has improved greatly, uh, but it still needs some work. It took a lot of real deliberate work to sort of break the glass ceiling. Now I think there are a lot more women who are where people, where they've already proved their ability to do senior jobs and people look for them automatically. So I think, I think that's getting better. The, and I don't know that there are many countries that are, I don't know if there are any countries that are willing to say publicly that they don't want a woman. There might be some who would prefer not to, but we'll sort of ignore that and send them a woman anyway, in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, with, with Black Americans, with African Americans, that's been a real uphill struggle that goes back like 150 years. We first we sent the first black diplomats overseas before the Civil War, but we tended to confine them to African posts mm -hmm. uh, or to Haiti, mm -hmm. and it mm -hmm. took years before we started sending, uh, you know, people like mm -hmm. uh, Ed Perkins, top quality ambassadors, sent him to South Africa. They didn't like that, but that was you know, too damn bad. Mm -hmm. um, 
So now you're getting uh, gays and lesbians, some, not many, uh, our former ambassador to Vietnam mm -hmm. uh, was uh, was gay, and he took his husband with him. Mm -hmm. uh, Vietnamese seemed to put. On, he also was an excellent Vietnamese speaker, and he traveled all over Vietnam. Seemed to be quite popular. Uh, there, this is going to be an issue that people will have to think about. If you're going to send somebody to a country where the country as a whole has a very strong prohibition, you're gonna have to weigh how much you want to shove it down their throat because it's a US principle uh, and how much, because it's a US principle, you want to insist that mm -hmm. our standards are right and their standards are wrong. And we're pretty big on that, but you know, we, we tend to think if 10 years ago we had a completely different standard and we've now changed it, everybody ought to change it too. Mm -hmm. And we'll tend to push it pretty hard. So we'll continue to have some internal frictions there, but and it may change from administration to administration. But you know, the Trump administration was not noticeably friendly on some of these social issues, but it still has several uh, gay ambassadors out. Mm -hmm. So it isn't it isn't really a partisan issue, although maybe a social one. Mm -hmm. Yes, I wanted to ask you a question about uh, uh, the training. You have mentioned that you would like to see foreign service members uh, have about 8% of its population in training all the time. Uh, I must imagine this training must be immersive. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And as yeah. a context, many organizations have people in training, but it is just part of their jobs and they probably do, I don't know, anywhere between one hour a day or a couple of hours a week and so forth. Yeah, there, there are two different kinds of basic training that we're talking about. One is the kind of training you can do in short courses, uh, taking people out of the office for a couple of days. We, we do a lot of that. But what we don't do is, for instance, a decent mid-level course. The example is the Army, it, or the military, but I know the Army side best. You know, <clears throat> you become an officer, you've done initial training. You get to be a captain, three levels up, there's a captain's course. Mm -hmm. You get up to be a major lieutenant colonel, and you're heading for command and general staff college for a year learning how much bigger organizations function, how the staff functions, equivalent to you know, all kinds of things. So if you're a foreign service officer and you've had 10 or 15 years in, you've seen about four to five posts. And that is very important, but it's not the world. It's not multilateral diplomacy. It's not a lot of negotiation. Uh, it's not managing a big organization. Yeah. So our, our way, historically, we were a much smaller organization. So historically, people, it was kind of an apprenticeship. You learned because you saw, you know, very senior people up close and you saw how they worked. Well, now we're over 8,500 officers, and that's not counting the civil service side. And two-thirds of them have 10 years or less in the service. Mm -hmm. You can't do this as an apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. Now, they're doing a lot in distance learning. And that's very creative. And the Foreign Service Institute that does the training has built a lot of courses. They've done good stuff. But you need to think about how we assign officers. We send our best people to our highest pressure jobs. Mm -hmm. If you're in a job where you work 50 hours a week, you're probably not doing a long, a distance learning course. You're sure not doing it if you're working 60 hours a week and you're not keeping up the coursework if you have a crisis and you're working seven days a week. In Baghdad, I kept a log. We were working between 90 and 100 hours a week. Mm -hmm. um, since you send your best people and should to do your hardest jobs, if you're depending on distance learning, you've decided you're not going to send your best people to do the training because mm -hmm. they're going to be in jobs where they can't do it. Mm -hmm. So that's why we need to do it. Mm -hmm. 
There's this question over here and then over here. All right, so you brought up languages a couple of time and that times, and that's one of the areas that I'm the most interested in when it comes to international things. So you said that the um, State Department's super great at training. That's like the one area of training that they're very good at. Um, as an American who grew up in American public school system, I was able to take languages in middle school and high school and then also college. But then when I went to study in another country, like Basically, no one expected me to be able to speak the language. It was like, yay, let's speak English. You, you speak English. The country was Finland. I was able to speak Finnish because I went to Concordia Language Villages and then did some um, study after that mm. before going. And that was like, I, I mean, I could say that that was the thing that opened a lot of doors. But for a lot of people, they just thought, oh, no, you don't need to you don't need to learn any Finnish before yeah, going to Finland. Yes, that won't do. help you. Yes, you do. And so um, kind of cycling back, I work in higher ed now. And just like you say, the State Department budget gets like microscope and where can we like, you know, take from that? I also see that being true for humanities, especially languages. What can we cut? What isn't useful anymore? What are students not wanting to? And then let's just give all the money to STEM. Let's forget completely about languages. And it makes me really sad because I realize, you know, we're still sending students to study abroad, luckily. But I feel like that's also somewhat on a slippery slope as we, you know, handle more, honestly, like diversity in students coming in. They go, oh, they can't go and study abroad. And I'm like, no, they must go and study. So um, what what would you say are some ideas or are there any like State Department influences within like K-12 education and university. So before graduation from um, undergrad that, you know, get the ball rolling with the language study because, you know, there's been a lot of studies with brains and ability to pick up on tones and uh, yeah, just mm -hmm. there, I could go on and on about this, but are there any like efforts coming yeah. from the state department or support towards K-12 foreign language um, instruction and then yeah, you sort of answered yes. You you in, language is super crucial and important in State Department work, um, but yeah, I guess that's the main question. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I don't I don't know of any State Department efforts, and I'm not sure, frankly, that the larger education structure would pay much attention to the State Department telling them how to run K twelve education. Um, they don't always pay attention when we're telling them how to do foreign policy. Uh, <laughs> There, but there are a lot of efforts to incentivize people who are interested in diplomacy. That's a much smaller subset of students. Mm -hmm. But uh, you come in with a higher salary if you have certain languages. You, if you pass the test, you come into the State Department Foreign Service Officer, you have five years that you're essentially on probation. You have to be tenured. And one of the requirements for tenure is you have to pass a language exam, at least some language. Now, State Department will train you if you don't have any, but you make more money and get tenured faster if you come in with the language. Um, beyond that, no, I can't say there's anything directly from the State Department. I can tell you, you know, personal prejudice, I totally agree with you. Uh, I think you don't understand foreign cultures as well until you speak with people in their own language. They just, they, it's not that people are are manipulative or that they're hiding things, but when people speak in their own language, there's an aspect of how they think about things that comes out differently than if they're speaking English. Uh, there's also a big problem that some languages are much harder to learn than others. You know, the State Department, if we take somebody who knows no French and get them up to professional fluency in French, that's a six month course. Do the same thing in Arabic or Chinese is a two year course. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot more work. Mm -hmm. And you need it more for some jobs than for other jobs. But if you're gonna do political work, if you're gonna do cultural work, if you're gonna talk to younger people, you gotta be able to talk to them. You can't talk to them through a translator. So I totally agree with you. I mean, STEM is important, but when you see a lot of people complaining about the US government, who are complaining about something that's partly in our constitution, or they complain about why they can't get money because the constitution sets up a certain system. Mm -hmm. You know, They're complaining in part because they're ignorant, because they haven't learned what our own government is about 
let alone how to fix anything. So uh, yeah, I'd like to see people with a little more civic education so that at least if they're going to be angry, they could be angry without being stupid about it. <laughs> That's great. That's great. That's probably not diplomatic either. <laughs> But I'm retired. You know. Right, right, right. Well, thank you very much for the conversation, first and foremost. I think it's been really insightful. Uh, so I appreciate your candid remarks as well. I have a question on the role of ambassadors and their connections to policy development and civil society engagement. You had mentioned before that you know the day-to-day -day of an ambassador is highly influenced by the local context, local developments, of course, but it's also developed by policy and priorities, as you also mentioned, right? So I was wondering if you could tell us from your experience and also what you have been working at the academy, what's the role that ambassadors are expected or should play, yeah. both with civil society locally when they are appointed, but also connecting that, especially when the head of state and government announces priorities mm -hmm. through summits or through executive orders, and now they're in a position where they're supposed to rally support from other states to yeah. get that done, right? So what will be What's the approach on that and what would be perhaps yeah. tips I mean, for this, this, You've asked a really important question, a little difficult to answer sort of globally because in some cases it's going to differ from country to country. It's also going to differ if you have a government that is closing down at civil society and making it difficult for you to talk to. It, it As an abstract, as a general statement, it is always important to talk to civil society because that's the incubator for political change. And if you don't want to be surprised by political change, then you need to be trying to talk to people who are going to produce it. Uh, there is also a huge role for civil society in creating international positions. So the United States has never joined the landmine treaty. Mm -hmm. Although we have far more control over our landmines than Russia, China, various other countries. But well, that was a long, complicated story. I won't go through it. But essentially, you had a very committed civil society movement in multiple countries that framed the debate in a way that was so stark that although we had one critical reservation, we wanted to preserve the ability to have minds that protected our troops that we controlled that you could take out. We couldn't get that exemption because the civil society process had gotten ahead of the engagement with governments and locked governments into a position. So that by not having engaged early enough with civil society, we found we couldn't get to where we should have got on that treaty. So it, it's always important to talk to civil society. How you do it is gonna depend a lot on the conditions you're operating under, how much freedom they have to talk to you, you know, all of these things. Um, and the other part of your question was what do you, uh, you sort of asked generally about ambassadors' role in policy. And now that's going to vary a lot with different policy. You know, if you're talking about Arab Israeli policy, that's presidential policy. You, you might get a word in if you're the ambassador to Israel, but it's not dispositive. But there's an awful lot of policy that is developed at lower levels so that is reaction situation. Kissinger used to complain that policy is made in the cables. You, you react, you get instruction. And then an active ambassador in a great many situations will be trying to shape the instructions that he or she gets. Mm -hmm. And they're doing that by an interactive process with Washington and what they report and who they work with. And usually when you're talking about policy change, you have to build it over time and you have to build a consensus. I have never seen a policy change because one person wrote a brilliant paper and everybody said, oh, I never thought of that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it doesn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. But you can build a policy over time mm -hmm. by how you... I mean, I'm not saying that you should slant your reporting. That's unprofessional. But if you know that things are... or you see things are happening, you have to make sure that they get reported also in a way that influences policy. But then it's a process of talking to people. And one of the things in policy formation is you have to bring other people on board so that they are part of the process. And the, in that process of doing that, they become stakeholders in the policy. They also may change the policy so it isn't exactly what you wanted perfectly. But 
at the end of the day, you build a consensus so that by the time somebody proposes a change, the reaction is, oh, well, everybody knows that, where it's not revolutionary. Mm -hmm. But if you have, if you suddenly come and say, I need a 90 degree change in policy and nobody's prepared for it, the first reaction is, no, what are you talking about? Uh, so you, you have to, so if you're an active ambassador, you're working all kinds of channels and levers in a way that are not publicly visible in order to build the consensus for where you're trying to go. Um, I have a question from online, and okay. then we have time for one more question after that. Um, so from online, um, it says, this may be a tough question. With the embarrassing retreat from a 20-year occupation and war in Afghanistan, do you agree that America has failed in its Mideast diplomacy? Well, I think we certainly failed in Afghanistan. Look, first of all, you have to understand I am not approaching this question in a disinterested way. You know, I not only served in as ambassador in Afghanistan, I started going back in 2010. I was back every single year except for COVID, and I was back about six weeks before the collapse. Mm -hmm. um, so, and so I have skin in the game. Uh, and that's a long answer. Does it fail our whole Middle Eastern policy? No, that's excessive. Uh, and also, we have gone through periods before where we have failed and our credibility has gone way down and it's come way back again. And I remember after the withdrawal from Lebanon, uh, which many of you are probably too young to remember, uh, and after the bombing of, uh, when after we pulled out of the Philippines as well, where you would say, why would that affect Middle East policy? Well, because people said, you know, Middle East leaders said, well, they were your friends. How did you drop them? So there was a period where our, our credibility went way down. And I remember when we, many people may have forgotten that we, during the Iran-Iraq war, decided to escort Kuwaiti oil tankers with our fleet. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I went with my ambassador in Abu Dhabi to tell the foreign minister that we were gonna start this operation. And he was very polite, but you could tell that he didn't really believe we would have the guts to stick it out. Uh, well, then we had an undeclared war with Iran. We sunk their mine layers. We occupied one of their oil platforms. Everybody's forgotten that we ever had this. Um, and, uh, and, and the credibility went back up again. So right now the credibility, well, first of all, it was badly damaged by the, not just by the decision to withdraw, which you can, you can argue responsibly, you can argue either side of that question, that we should have stayed, that we should have gone. The withdrawal itself turned into an unmitigated disaster. And there are a lot of reasons for that. And that clearly hurt us. On the other hand, Ukraine has brought back a lot because we've held the alliance together. We've held the uh, equipment. Russia is being hurt. We'll see how this works over time. If we fall apart in Ukraine, that's going to hurt us again. But these things are connected. You don't get to isolate one region and say, well, you failed over there, but this is fine over here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's more like a spider's web. If you touch it in one place, it wiggles all over. Uh, so we were definitely hurt, but what has hurt us in the Middle East with certain Arab states is a long process that goes through, um, beginning with the Obama administration, with doubts about our firmness when we didn't strike Syria after we said we had red lines on chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. Then going into the Trump administration, where we didn't react to various things and we created a lot of doubt about our commitment. And then Afghanistan, which added on. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of restiveness of Saudi Arabia, UAE, states with whom we have very strong relations, mm -hmm. at least about how much they can count on us and what they can count on us for. Afghanistan is part of that, but it is not the be all and end all of the question. Mm -hmm. What do we got time for? If I'd have shorter answers, you'd get more questions. In. One, quick, <laughs> one quick question. You talked about the need to rebuild or build this diplomatic reserve corps, right? You talked about a thousand people, men, women, over the course of four years, um, maybe even longer. What type of skill set are you looking for? Okay. It's a, the question I'm not sure if everybody could hear was what kind of skill sets you're looking for. Actually, the broadly, a whole lot. 
administrative counselor, but the the way the plan is written is that you would take the first year to do a survey in the State Department with all the different bureaus mm -hmm. saying, if we have a crisis, if you have, you know, as you look forward a number of years, what problems do you foresee that could be a crisis? What kind of skills would you need in your area? Whether it's the regional bureau talking about countries or the consular bureau talking about serving American citizens or the administrative bureau talking about what kind of skills they, you know, what were the problems they encountered when they had to charter aircraft uh, for the last evacuation, how to make for, so the idea is you take the first year to build out what the military would call the table of organization and equipment in detail to answer that question in much more detail than I can answer it tonight. So then as you build the reserve corps over the next four years, you are recruiting specifically against this set of skills. Doesn't mean all of them necessarily have to be diplomats. Some of them may be people who are not diplomats, but who have financial skills or administrative skills that you're going to need in a crisis. Uh, and they may be all over the United States. They don't have to be people who are just old State Department guys or gals. Uh, so that's how you would build the skill. And then after a few years, you would again relook at the whole question to say, you know, did we get this right? Or do we need to modify it? Mm -hmm. Ambassador Newman, I want to first of all say thank you very much for um, opening our eyes this evening and then being engaged in this, this, this discourse. It's a discourse that's got to continue. Um, there's more to come. And I, I welcome the opportunity for us to continue it with you. Well, now, I want to also say thank you to the audience for the great questions and the engagement that you've brought both here in the room as well as those who've been online. A lot of us are waiting now for Phil Hansen, who's going to come in and uh, take it from here. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank